Hello, and welcome to Mostly Climate. I'm Rosie Oakes. It's been six weeks since the end of COP26 in Glasgow, and today we're going to be talking about some of the key outcomes from a climate science perspective. I'm joined today by Graham Madge, who is the Senior Met Office Press Officer and the podcast Climate Correspondent. Hi, Graham. Hi, Rosie. How are you? Looking forward to discussing COP. Yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing about all your experiences there. So Graham was at COP26, so he has some great personal stories to tell us and some insights from the event. So we're going to hear from him and we're also going to listen to some of the conversations he had while he was at COP26. Later in the podcast, we're also going to delve into the updated global carbon budgets, which highlight the importance of accurate data to keep initiatives on the road to net zero, 1.5 degrees and understanding future risk and resilience. First, to give a flavour of what we're discussing here today, Here's Professor Stephen Belcher, Met Office Chief Scientist, with his own thoughts on the resounding outcomes from COP26. One of the really distinctive features of COP26 was how science was at the heart of everything that was done. So the agreement that was signed by all the parties at the end had a statement about the centrality of science both in establishing climate change, but also being part of the solutions. So that's a major step forward in recognising the role of science. Graham, do you want to comment on what Stephen said? One of the joys of being at COP26 was hearing the great words and thoughts coming from everybody involved in climate change. So the opportunity to hear our chief scientists talking about the future direction of science and other chief scientists from the UK and around the world and the sorts of conversations that people at the top of the climate change game are having to try and solve this crisis. Yeah, that must have been fascinating. And I think especially after the last year that we've had with everybody working a lot more in isolation, to then see all those people together. I know from what I was reading on Twitter, scientists having those big conversations that can be so great when you get people from all over the world in one room. Well, when you think, you know, we've gone over the last couple of years from being locked down where we've not been allowed out to going to one of the biggest events in the UK, it's quite a transformation. And it was almost a shock to be involved in such a big, exciting environment with so many people there with so much to say. Your job at COP was kind of to be a roving reporter to interview some of these figures who were there to speak about climate change. So... Who did you get to speak to? Well, it was an opportunity that was too good to ignore. I don't normally rub shoulders with people like Sir Patrick Vallance or with the um, Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization. But as these people were coming past, I just felt emboldened to go and speak to them about their thoughts. I was determined to come away from COP with as much of an idea about how the future of this process will continue, that I thought it was a great opportunity to to chat to them. And I was amazed, in part, at their generosity of time and spirit. But I think that, in some ways, goes to, to capture the spirit of COP. Everybody is generous with their time because they love talking to people that share their passion for solving some of the world's greatest problems. So in addition to those, I spoke to the Chilean science minister as well to get an idea of you know, how an individual nation is coping with the problems of climate change. But in addition to the scientists and the leaders, you actually see a great deal of people who have a passion for climate change because of the impacts that they're facing. So there were lots of indigenous people from South American rainforests. There was a great deal of passion from that community and they were doing a fantastic job in representing their plight and their cause and bringing that to attention. So. You know, nobody was left, I think, in any doubt that this isn't just some abstract thing. Climate change is a factor that will affect all of us in our lives, wherever you are on the planet. So that was a real lesson for me that, you know, we are all in this together. Sometimes 
tensions got quite high. Um, there were some flare-ups where people were, you know, in heated conversations or even argument about it. But that was all because it was so passionate. People's emotions were just running high. It sounds amazing. And I'm glad that there were so many voices that were in the room, because I think that's something that we've talked about on the podcast before, is that you have to have all the voices in the room to really make sure that the solutions that you're posing to these huge problems are global in their reach. And so it's great that there were Indigenous scientists there, as well as governments from around the world and scientists from the UK, for example. Um, What was the feeling like on the streets outside? The feelings on the streets were quite mixed. A huge number of visitors, um, both delegates to the conference and also people trying to raise their concerns about climate change. And all of that came to a head with Extinction Rebellion marches through the city. I actually saw a march that came very close to the hotel and I was very interested in seeing what the interaction would be like with the police and the city residents. So you have all of that, people that had travelled to Glasgow because of their interest, but then also you had the city residents. So while I was there, I had opportunity to speak to people in hotels and restaurants and just to get their opinion about what it was like to have this massive circus descend on your city. Okay, so let's talk about what actually was agreed at COP26. There was the Glasgow Climate Pact that came out of all the discussions. What does that mean for us moving forwards? Glasgow Climate Pact was a big deal to negotiate. The UK negotiating team had to work with a lot of different interests and try and bring those 190 odd countries together. Obviously, there was some progress on greenhouse gas emissions. That still presents a challenge. Whether we will get to 1.5 is something that is still troubling our scientists. And it's certainly clear that with the next COP in Egypt, it's definitely something where the work will have to continue. But then, you know, there were other unexpected, perhaps, benefits coming from it. The agreement on forests, for example, it's not all about trying to curb greenhouse gas emissions. So getting an agreement on forests, which can both be a carbon source, but a carbon sink if managed well. So, you know, the fact that there were agreements on illegal logging, for example, so hopefully forests that are still in existence have a better future. But there's also growing ambition to try and see some forests restored or even replaced in order to try and take on the climate challenge so that forests can actually be a carbon sink. The news on methane was fantastically welcome. Methane is really one of the forgotten greenhouse gases when it comes to tackling climate change. Certainly carbon dioxide, as everybody knows, is the big problem. But by tackling some of the other greenhouse gases like methane, this is helping to tackle the problem not only head on, but also in a broad way so that you're tackling all of the issues which can help to reduce climate change impacts. But I think, Rosie, one of the things here, and as a climate scientist yourself, I think you'll be delighted at this, that climate science came of age at COP26. It felt to me as though climate science had gone from just trying to prove the case that climate was changing, but now It's gone to where climate scientists can offer more of the solutions and be a part of the process to help restore our atmosphere and our climate. One of the things that I was picking up was the need for science to be more multidisciplinary. So climate science will go from perhaps being in a fairly rarefied bubble to actually being something which will be at the heart of a bigger scientific movement. It's always my favourite part of science where you get to work between disciplines. You know, scientists are always talking about interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. And like you say, it pretty much just means instead of just working on climate, you're working on climate and ecology or climate and economics. And in the past, when I've done research before, always the most uh, interesting science in my perspective is done at these boundaries of different fields. When you bring people together together, I think it's perfect timing as well, coming almost 30 years 
through a journey. Climate scientists were talking about climate change in the early 90s. We saw the Earth Summit. We saw the formation of the Hadley Centre in 1990. So 30 or so years on is part way through the, well, exactly halfway through the journey to 2050, when we know that the climate will have changed even more. But by 2050, we hope to be approaching net zero and really tackling the problems of climate change head on. Graham, you just mentioned our pathway to net zero. So in this second part of the podcast, I wanted to talk a bit about the updated global carbon budgets. Global carbon budget is just a calculation of the balance between how much carbon dioxide, as well as methane and nitrous oxide, is being put into the atmosphere relative to the amount that's being output or stored, for example, as a sink in land or in the ocean. So on land, for example, carbon dioxide is taken up into trees and stored in the wood. So a calculation of a global carbon budget is just what's going into the atmosphere versus what's coming out of the atmosphere. And this is updated every year. In 2020, carbon dioxide emissions actually dropped by 5.4%. So that's a decrease of 2.4 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide, which is the largest drop ever recorded. And I had a little look at the data earlier on today, and the largest contribution to that drop was actually a decrease in road transportation. Unfortunately, the numbers for 2021 saw that the carbon dioxide emissions had increased by 4.9%. So we're essentially back to where we were in 2019. So the global carbon budget is a really important thing for us to think about because we need to decrease our emissions and, in fact, offset some of our emissions so that we can reach net zero, which just means the amount of emissions we're putting in is equal to the amount of emissions we are taking out again. Graham, was net zero talked a lot about at COP26? Did you hear a lot of conversations around that? I think it was interesting, Rosie, the way that you were framing the reduction in emissions that we've seen because of the pandemic. In some ways, it's helpful because the five or six percent reduction that we saw in 2020 is about the level that we would need to see on an annual basis in order to get to net zero. But you could be forgiven for feeling quite depressed about that because you think, well, we've all suffered during the pandemic one way or another. And does that mean that I've got to endure that every year for the next 30 years? But of course, although emissions were cut during the first year of the pandemic, it was done in a perhaps slightly clumsy way. It certainly wasn't a phased way because of the the measures that were necessary to be brought in in order to protect health services and, and, and people's health generally. But of course, in a pathway to net zero, it would be a lot more planned and there would also be huge opportunities on the way for economies to develop and transform and for new opportunities. Employment sectors will inevitably grow, um, particularly with regard to green jobs. And during the conference, I had the opportunity to talk about the links between COVID and climate science with Sir Patrick Vallance, who many people will know is the government chief scientist, but he was also the chief scientist for COP26. Climate science has been the diagnostician. It picked up the signals, it told the world which direction things were going in. It's been remarkably important to reach now a very universal consensus as to where we are and to define the boundaries of that and to make sure that 1.5 is understood to be the limit and we've got to aim for that. Where we are now is moving from diagnosis to treatment and climate science will be part of the therapeutic response as well. How do we know we are headed in the right direction? What do we need to measure to be sure that we're on track? How do we make sure that those measurements can be locked into plans so that people know that as they develop plans, they're headed in the right direction. In terms of the solutions that are possible with being on a pathway to net zero, is there a role, do you think, for climate science to advise which of those pathways might be best? Well, I think where climate science can help 
is to look at the solutions that are being proposed and advise on where you're likely to get the biggest bang for your buck. But, and I think this is quite an important but, we shouldn't allow that to be a sort of cherry picking type of approach where people say, well, I'll just do that one. Because we know this is a widespread whole society change across a range of areas. I think the measurement, the direct measurement of things like emissions is going to be important as we go forward as well. So we know what it is we're trying to correct and can tell that we are correcting it. Given your experience of the COVID pandemic, what would you translate from COVID into the new challenge that we face with climate emergency? One of the things about COVID has been, first of all, science has been absolutely central to the response to COVID, and it's been global, and that international science has been crucial. And the second is the public have actually bought into it and gone along with it. And both of those things are going to be necessary going into this longer term, much more impactful crisis than COVID. And as part of that, we know that we're going to need to make changes individually We also know that data are going to be important. So one of the really crucial things in COVID has been access to data that can allow us to monitor, understand, respond to what's happening. Same is true for climate, data flows, data analysis, data visualisation, being able to help the decision makers to understand which direction things are going in, where uncertainties are, because there are lots of uncertainties, and how to narrow that uncertainty with experimentation, trial, measurement, correction. Sir Patrick Valance talking to Graham at COP. I thought that was really interesting and I was particularly fascinated by how he described how climate scientists are going to go from kind of the ones diagnosing the problem to actually being who people will go to to understand how to you know put in place adaptation measures. We're already seeing that happening. For example, the work that we do at the Met Office internationally, we're working with partners to make sure if they're making any adaptations to their current setups, that those are climate proofed for the future. So I feel like that climate science is already shifting, but it will be interesting to see how it continues to change as we move forward. One of the things that I found most fascinating was talking to people who were able to very eloquently explain the impacts on their own nation. I had an opportunity to interview uh, Andres Kouv, who is the Chilean science minister, and he told me about the impact on Chile. And I thought that was fascinating. When you look at Chile, you've got a country that goes through so many lines of latitude, bordered by the Pacific and the Andes, and has virtually every habitat in between. And he explained very clearly the challenges that communities across the nation will face from water security to problems with fisheries and indeed other problems as well. Chile is a country that suffers seven of the nine vulnerability criteria that has been established internationally. One of them very clear that has been affecting the country recently is drought. Chile has the Andes Mountains, accumulation of snow, ice and the glaciers significant amounts of water in the mountains. And we've been uh, having a very dry season that has extended for 10 or 12 years. So it's been a very long period of time. And that is already affecting the human population, is affecting agriculture. And we've had to implement urgent measures to provide water to the cities during the summer. So it's a very clear manifestation of climate change. Similar to what happens maybe in the Pacific Islands, where the sea level rise has affected communities. In our country, the lack of water is severely affecting also some communities. Together with that, we have some issues in biodiversity. We have the desert, which is advancing to the south. And of course, it's a country that has a very long coastline. And along the coastline, many cities, villages are suffering from severe climate events. Uh, the rise of sea levels. So uh, in general, I would say that uh, Chile is a country which is suffering directly the effects of climate change in a very significant manner. And it also uh, means that we have to act urgently. And this is what we've been doing from the Ministry of Science and articulating the scientific community to have the scientific advice, recommendations, and know how to act 
Graham, I think those examples by Andre Couve, where he talks about the different populations being affected by different parts of climate change, for example, some areas getting too much water, some areas getting not enough water, is something that we've seen in other areas around the globe as well. I've recently been doing some work in sub-Saharan Africa, and it seems that the challenges there span similar amounts of diversity, like you're saying, from the fisheries to there's flooding, there's urban development, there's what are farmers going to be doing. So that we are still facing a lot of challenges, despite the amazing advancements in climate science. I've been following this for three or four decades. And at the start, it was all about all oh, the future change, the future climate, future changes, our climate is going to change. Well, as you and I know, our climate is changing now and will continue to change as much as we all hope COP26 will be a long lasting success. It's not going to stop climate change in its tracks. Maybe it will send it on a more downward path so that eventually we can tackle climate change. But in the intervening time, we have so many problems that climate change will throw up from extreme weather events, crop failures, new pests. So it was fascinating to talk to so many people who are on the front line of climate change and you know were able to give an insight into to how their communities will fare. This comes back to what you were saying previously about the interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary nature of climate change moving forwards. You know, as we're going to be tackling all of these questions across multiple fields, we need to make sure that we have experts from the farming community, from the social science community, economists, all sorts of people who we haven't worked with before and from all over the world to make sure that the solutions that we are putting in place and the adaptation strategies that we're putting in place in the meantime are just and fair and don't put anybody in more danger than they're currently in. It was interesting to see a lot of business interests represented at COP. And I think that that is a fascinating dimension because business communities and governments and all sorts of organizations are needing to think about long term changes, might be long term changes to things like their supply chains, to the investments that they need to make. You've got governments and administrations around the world thinking about measures that they need to bring in, perhaps sea defences, flood relief, all of those sorts of things. People are needing to make decisions about infrastructure or developments or the sorts of crops that they'll need to grow in 30, 40 years time. They need to make those decisions now based on the best projections we have. So after all the amazing discussions at COP26, one of the key things that we're still talking about is limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. Now, we talked to Chris Jones, who gave a seminar on this topic. Now, Chris has been on our podcast before. He is an expert in carbon cycle modelling and was involved with the most recent IPCC report. Chris makes some really interesting point that one thing is really clear that we need to decrease our carbon emissions to limit warming. And we need to work much harder now than if we'd started a bit earlier. So he said, if we'd have started in 1990, it would have been five times easier to achieve that 1.5 degrees C target of limiting warming than it is in 2020. So I think one of the really key takeaways is that action needs to be taken now and that will give us a better chance of limiting the warming, but it will also be much more cost effective to take the action now versus taking it further down the line. So one of the things that I had the opportunity to do at COP was to interview Professor Pateri Talas, Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization, about some of the calamities and disasters there have been with the climate during 2021 the devastating heat wave in British Columbia and northwestern United States, the challenges that there have been in southern Europe with the heat wave and the fact that we're getting very close to 50 degree temperatures around the Mediterranean, and the fact that around the world we're seeing devastating wildfires, rapid warming of the Arctic. Here's what he told me. 
we have been breaking several uh, extreme temperature records uh, in Siberia, in Italy, in western parts of Canada and the United States. And we have seen some severe flooding events in Germany. There were about uh, 200 casualties in India, more than 1,000 casualties also in and, and forest fires in Canada, uh, western United States and uh, in the Arctic. We actually broke all-time high in the Arctic Circle, 38 uh, degrees. Those are the parameters that we were reporting. So this is demonstrating that climate change is there and uh, we have seen progress in the wrong direction. So we've seen a lot of extremes this year. What message would you like world leaders to take from reading that report? And what action would you like them to take here at COP? Very strong proof that uh, climate change is there and, and, and there's also very strong proof that human activities have had a big impact on that. And now it's time to act. So we have both the technical and financial means to be successful in climate mitigation, even to reach the low limit of Paris Agreement 1.5. And we have all the means to reach the upper limit of Paris Agreement 2 degrees. We hear a lot at this COP about climate financing, but what do you think about what MET organizations around the world can do? What do you think, for example, about the potential for increasing capacity building? Besides uh, climate mitigation, we have to pay attention to climate adaptation. And one very powerful way to adapt to climate change is to invest in early warning services. Only half of our members have proper early warning services and very few less developed countries are able to forecast the impact of weather events. And then we have major gaps in our observing systems, especially in Africa, Caribbean and Pacific Islands and, and also some parts of Latin America. So we have to invest in the basic observing systems and that would enhance the accuracy of early warning services in those data sparse areas, but also worldwide. Professor Pateri Talas, I think it's important to recognize that a lot of these events that we're seeing are covered by attribution studies. And this is something that was unheard of in the 1990s, that we can actually look at individual events like the heat wave in North America or Southern Europe and actually begin to see how much of a contribution there is from climate change within these events, providing proof that climate change is one of the key drivers behind these significant impacts. And I think, you know, although Chris Jones has said that, you know, we should have been starting this 30 years ago, it's true. But what we've got now is the evidence uh, for the impacts of these particular events, but also more creative ways of coming up with some solutions. I think that's a really nice place to end our episode today. We've come an awfully long way since 1990, but we still have a lot to do. Thanks to my guest, Graham Madge, for sharing his insight from COP. You've been listening to Mostly Climate. I'm Dr. Rosie Oakes, the producers were Claire Nazir and Graham Madge, and the editor was Adrian Holloway. Mostly Climate is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.